June 19th, 1944, USS Lexington. The radio man sits, sweating into his earphones. Contrary to rumor on Saipan, the Navy had not abandoned the Marines. They'd received reports of carriers closing in, a Japanese fleet coming to smash the Navy's task force and strand the troops ashore. A wave of dive bombers is headed towards Lexington. Hellcat fighters are scrambling to intercept. The radio man waits for contact. A scream in his earphones. Scratch one bomber, a pilot crows. More screams. Men yip, cheer, and count kills. Splash number six, the same pilot calls. He's become an ace in eight minutes. And he's not the only one. By the end of the day, the Hellcats have destroyed the core of Japan's air power in the Pacific. Officially, this is the Battle of the Philippine Sea, but the pilots will call it the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. This series is brought to you by World of Tanks PC. Check out the game at the link below and use the invite code FORAGER for extra goodies. It was a massacre. Within two days, the Japanese first mobile fleet lost three carriers to American aircraft and submarines, and nearly all of their veteran pilots. The survivors turned back towards Okinawa, their mission to relieve Saipan of failure. The threat at sea was over, but on land the battle raged. The Japanese defenders were tenacious, and the U.S. progressed slow. With the tank offensive a failure and their rescue fleet smashed, Lieutenant General Saito ordered troops to withdraw inland and defend every position to the death, using terrain to their advantage. Marines die in valley ambushes, clearing out caves, flushing pillboxes, and fighting room to room in refinery towns. Japanese troops use sugarcane fields to conceal movement and spring attacks. Marines respond by torching the fields. U.S. soldiers begin to christen this terrain with macabre nicknames, like Bloody Run and Purple Heart Ridge. Ashore since the second day of the invasion, on June 22nd, the U.S. Army's 27th Infantry Division begins battering its way through Death Valley, a deep depression where Japanese troops hold the ridges. Furious at their lack of progress, after five days, the invasion's commander, Marine General Holland Howland Mad Smith, fires the Army commander and pushes them on regardless of mounting casualties. As the Saipan invasion, estimated to take three days, drags on into its second week, both American and Japanese forces become more ruthless. Governments on both sides bombard their troops with propaganda, dehumanizing the enemy. Japanese commanders describe Americans as bloodthirsty devils and barbarians. American officers refer to the Japanese with racial slurs and speak in terms of extermination. There's little mercy. Japanese military ethos stigmatizes surrender, and commanders spread rumors that Americans torture and eat prisoners. Americans, for their part, know about the death marches and executions in the Philippines. As a result, surrender is both rarely offered and rarely accepted. Tragically, civilians sheltered in caves and fortifications are often caught in the middle of combat. Told that Americans will torture them if they're captured, hundreds instead decide to take their own lives jumping off cliffs en masse. American translators beg via bullhorn to stop, saying they've set up refugee camps, but it's no use. In some minds, it's evidence that the Japanese cannot be reasoned with. But one man thinks he can get through. Marine scout Guy Gabaldon had a unique background. Things had been rough growing up as a Mexican-American kid in Los Angeles. But when things hit bottom, a school friend named Lane Nakano had brought him home. Soon, he was living with the Nakanos, learning Japanese. They'd practically raised him. Now, his adopted family was in an internment camp, and Lane was in Europe fighting with the 442nd. Gabaldon can't believe that these enemies are as unthinking and inhuman as his officers claim. So one night, on guard duty, he walks into the jungle alone. He returns that morning with two Japanese soldiers he'd convinced to surrender. His commander is furious. Only an idiot would desert his post like that. As punishment, he gives Gabaldon another overnight shift. But that night, Gabaldon drops his rifle and walks off again. This time, he comes back with 50 people, soldiers and civilians. This time, instead of punishing him, the commander makes it Gabaldon's new job. So night after night, Gabaldon crawls into enemy territory, armed with nothing but candy, 
food, his voice, and a sack of grenades in case of emergency. He walks up to campfires and makes friends, goes into caves, and night after night, he brings back more people. Guy Gabaldon, the Pied Piper of Saipan, convinced over a thousand soldiers and civilians to surrender to U.S. forces. In doing so, he almost certainly saved their lives, because Lieutenant General Saito was planning a yuksai. Saito's forces had reached a critical point. His troops are foraging leaves and snails for sustenance. Medicine and ammunition are nearly gone, and he's running out of men. There's only 7,000 left. And thanks to the U.S. Navy, there would be no rescue. Saito had ordered bonsai charges since the first day of the invasion, but a yokusai was different. It came directly from the emperor, a mandate for every man, even the wounded and unarmed, to attack without fear. He gives the order by radio. Those too injured to fight will commit suicide. Anyone left has a simple directive. Attack before dawn. Kill seven Americans before you fall. He swears to advance with them and leave his bones on Saipan, the bulwark of the Pacific. But despite his message, Saito will not advance. He's too old, too valuable if taken alive. Instead, he eats a meal of crab meat and sake with his friend, Admiral Nagumo, who'd overseen the Pearl Harbor attack. Afterward, both commit suicide. As Saito and Nagumo share their final meal, the rank-and-file troops drink their last supply of sake and beer and talk about what tomorrow will bring. There's no hope of success, but dying in glory is better than being huddled in caves and waiting for the flamethrowers. Near dawn, they pick up anything they can find. Rifles, grenades, knives, pistols, swords. Some carry makeshift spears made from bamboo and bayonets. Then they charge the American lines in the largest and final bonsai attack of the war. Machine gun bullets rip through them. Those without weapons snatch them from dying comrades. They break over the 27th Infantry Division's front line and rush through the gaps between battalions. So many enemies are rushing the American line, there's no need to aim. Troops can fire blind and still hit the charging men. Lieutenant Colonel William O'Brien the commander of the 27th's 1st Battalion, 105th Regiment, walks up and down, shouting for his men to hold, firing Colts in each hand. Wounded and out of ammunition, he's last seen manning a jeep's machine gun. When they find his body the next day, it's discovered that he died out of ammunition, defending himself with a Japanese saber. They've broken the perimeter. Two battalions of the 27th are overrun. Behind the lines, Captain Ben Solomon, a dentist at home, now regimental surgeon, is at his aid station, trying to stop wounded men from bleeding to death. He hears a shout, and turns to see a Japanese soldier bayoneting one of his patients. Though not trained for combat, he shoots the soldier and charges into the fray with four Japanese troops following him. He yells to evacuate. As his patients limp out, Solomon slides into a foxhole. There's a machine gun there. The crew are dead. He holds the machine gun nest until he's overrun, stalling the assault long enough for his patients to escape. But not all the wounded make it. When two men die trying to carry Sergeant Thomas Baker to the rear, he refuses to be moved again. The veteran, known for his courage under fire, asks only to be propped up against a tree with a cigarette and a pistol. He will be found there later, gun empty, cigarette burned out, surrounded by enemy dead. O'Brien... Solomon and Baker would never go home. Their families received the Medal of Honor instead. Swamped and nearly out of ammunition, parts of the 27th Infantry begin rushing backward, fighting as they run. Cooks and clerks at HQ sections in the rear grab rifles to hold pockets of territory, islands in a bloody stream. Indeed, the Japanese have finally achieved their aim of driving the Americans into the sea. Around 75 soldiers take to the water, swimming out to a reef a hundred yards offshore for safety. Others establish thin secondary perimeters on the beach and hold until reinforcements clear the sector. The Yuksai was over, but it achieved its aim of shock and terror. The attack had nearly wiped out two U.S. Army battalions. That morning, the two battalions had a combined strength of 1,107 men. By nightfall, 400 were dead and 500 wounded, an 80% casualty rate from just one attack. But over 4,000 Japanese soldiers had died in the desperate assault. It was over. 
Surveying the carnage, Captain Oba Sakai knew Japanese resistance on Saipan was broken. Fearing for his medical company and the island's civilians, he scratched together a group of survivors and took to the mountains. They remained there, fighting a guerrilla war until his commander convinced him to surrender, three months after the war had ended. Victory on Saipan had immediate consequences. General Tojo Hideki resigned as prime minister, and the Japanese government accepted that victory was no longer possible. But they fought on, hoping to prevent an invasion of the homeland and removal of the emperor. With Saipan taken, Americans secured the rest of the Marianas chain, taking Tinian, Guam, and their valuable airstrips. When American bombers flattened Japanese cities and burned Tokyo, they would do so from airfields in the Marianas. And one year after the fighting concluded on Saipan, a lone B-29 bomber lifted off from Tinian Airfield. Overnight, MPs had kept troops away from the aircraft and its odd, specially built loading pit. The B-29 hit its rendezvous point, then turned towards Hiroshima. Once again, big thanks to everyone at World of Tanks PC for sponsoring this episode. If you think that looks as awesome as I do, check out the game at the link below and use the invite code FORAGER for extra goodies. Make sure to tell them extra credit sent you. <laughs>